Hello again. Were the apostles really Jehovah's Witnesses? As outlandish as that question may seem, Jehovah's Witnesses take pride in the claim that they, and they only, are imitators of the method of evangelism practiced by the early church. But did first century believers, even the apostles, canvas door to door? Or does the book of Acts present a different picture of preaching work in the early church? That's the back cover of the booklet that you saw in the capture at the beginning. Something we published 15 or so years ago because of the importance of this subject to Jehovah's Witnesses. Did the early Christians preach door to door? Now, the argument in this 20 page booklet is so detailed and so dense that I'd like to read it to you. I don't want to miss any of the argument and the consecutive points. So, if you don't mind, with your indulgence, I will read it and we'll break it into several segments. And our protection, in case I miss something out or you lose the thread of the argument, you can get this from us. Just send us an email and we'll email it back to you. The PDF is about 20 pages long. So, without further ado, did early Christians preach door to door? The claim. Each Jehovah's Witness you will talk to has a bottom line that proves him right and you wrong. No matter how good your arguments on the Trinity, salvation, hell, whatever subject you've chosen to dialogue, the fact that he's at your door and you're not at his when all is said and done decides whether he's the Christian or you are. That is the bottom line. Whatever subject you discuss, however much time you give him, he and his fellow Jehovah's Witnesses, and only Jehovah's Witnesses, are Christians because, one, they and they only use the true name of God, Jehovah. Two, they and they only know the truth about the kingdom of God, which they will assert was the emphasis of Jesus and the apostles. And three, they and they only not only know these truths, but preach them door to door, again in imitation of Jesus and his earliest followers. Until you strip away these unique badges which the witness wears, you'll probably flail away in futility trying to dislodge one brick at a time from the Watchtower's complex belief system. How much simpler to remove the foundation stones. For the Jehovah's Witness, the foundation of his faith is the Watchtower organization, the faithful and discreet slave class, which he believes is predicted by Jesus in Matthew 24, 45-51. But if you attack his mother, for that is how the Watchtower trains him to think of the organization, as the wife of Jehovah, you run the risk of losing his ear. It's far better to chip away at the second tier of the foundation, the three badges listed above, which as far as the witness is concerned, prove that Jehovah's Witnesses and, and Mother have the truth, as witnesses habitually refer to their religion. We might even reduce the fundamentals of witness belief to a simple sentence. Jehovah's Witnesses have the truth because they are the only religion that goes door to door. No witness, of course, will admit that this is the only proof of the true religion. Nevertheless, when you survey the history of the Watchtower, you quickly realize this form of evangelism is the constant, the mark, which separates witnesses from other groups espousing similar beliefs. Others challenge the Trinity, others turn the hose on hell, Many evangelicals and many cultists emphasize the second coming, but no other group organizes systematic visitation of every home to spread its beliefs. A Jehovah's Witness, if asked which is the most important of all Bible teachings, will probably answer the vindication of Jehovah's name, or the preaching of Jehovah's name in kingdom, or something similar. But the Watchtower did not promote the name Jehovah widely till the 1930s. They officially became Jehovah's Witnesses in 1931. Nor did they publicly promote the earthly kingdom that is now their good news until 1935. If then the Watchtower did not promote these peculiar beliefs which marked them as God's people till over five decades into their history, why did God disdain to use them at all before that? The witness conviction is that God saw in them, despite their imperfect understanding, a willingness to preach the good news in the face of opposition. This is why the Watchtower literature is so fixated on the years 1914 to 1920. 
seven-year period, which to outsiders is one unbroken, embarrassing sequence of watchtower false prophecies, but which in modern, modern watchtower mythology has somehow been turned into the era of their greatest triumph and vindication. God did not cast them off for their fundamentally unsound beliefs by modern watchtower standards, or judge them unfaithful because of their perfect prophetic record, 100% failure. Rather, according to witness understanding of Malachi 3, the Lord Jesus came to his temple suddenly in 1919 and pronounced the watchtower leaders as faithful and discreet, sealing them as his unique slave, the only organization he would henceforth recognize and use. What was the basis of the Lord's judgment? Perhaps we gain a clue from the book Revelation, its grand climax at hand, 1988. This commentary on the last book of the Bible has been studied several times in witness congregations in the 1990s. Obviously, watched our leaders continue to hope that its revisionist interpretation of the place of Jehovah's Witnesses in the 20th century will convince the present generation of their divinely ordained destiny, predestined collectively, that is, not individually. Like all other interpretations of Revelation published by the Watchtower Society, Climax details how the 1914 to 1925 activities of the Watchtower fulfilled Bible prophecy. Here, the imagination of the writer seems to know no bounds. Following the interpretive method used by the Society ever since its second president's own commentary on Revelation, Light, two volumes in 1931, Climax repaints this period in an orgy of self-congratulation. The Watchtower's principal publication of the period, The Finnish Mystery, 1917, is described on page 165 as, quote, a powerful commentary on Revelation and Ezekiel, unquote. The only power this book contains today, and retains today, is the power to remove Jehovah's Witnesses from the Watchtower. So embarrassing are its many wild claims that the Society has not reprinted the Finnish mystery in seven decades. Rutherford's work Light was the official replacement for it. Nevertheless, the leaders of the Society continue to insist that the publication and distribution of the Finnish mystery were among the greatest accomplishments before God. Why? Climax sees it this way. Quote, In the United States, the irate clergy used the war hysteria as an excuse to get the book banned. In other countries, the book was censored. Nevertheless, God's servants kept fighting back with fiery issues of the four-page tract entitled Kingdom News. As the Lord's Day proceeded, other publications would make clear Christendom's spiritually defunct condition. Between 1914 and 1918, the anointed remnant boldly drew attention to the spiritual drought in Christendom and warned of fiery judgment the coming of the great and fear-inspiring day of Jehovah. That's a quote from Climax book, pages 165 to 166. Forgotten are the Finnish mysteries date-setting, false prophecies, and worshipful treatment of the Laodicean messenger, Charles Taze Russell. What counts to the Watchtower leaders today, and what they obviously think counts to God too, is the society's fiery pronouncements during this period. They're boldly denouncing Christendom. In summary, what really counts in the society's view is not the content of these publications. If it did, they would be reprinted today. But the guts demonstrated in circulating them. The Watchtower Society, finally, is God's modern Elijah and Moses. These quotes from Climax occur in a section tracing the career of the two witnesses of Revelation 11. And God is with the modern Elijah and Moses because they prophesy, however inaccurately, against Christendom. It's no coincidence that the scandal of the Finnish mystery was immediately forgotten by Rutherford and his headquarters cohorts. Instead of retreating into the wilderness for some soul-searching and honest self-evaluation, as the real Elijah did after his contest with the Baal prophets, Rutherford and his colleagues just got busier with their publishing projects. Millions Now Living Will Never Die, 1920, replaced the Finnish mystery as the calling card of the watchtower door-to-door -door coal porteurs. 
This new campaign, focusing the Bible students on a new date, 1925, was an extremely effective way of moving Russell's followers away from the prior failed dates, 1914, 1950, 1918, and 1920. Rutherford's most brilliant move, though, was to mobilize all the Bible students in the new campaign. By 1927, even the failure of the 1925 prediction in millions hardly caused a blip in the advertise, advertise, advertise hysteria which now consumed the faithful. Now, however, they were no longer carrying founder Russell's books door to door. The seven volumes of studies in the scriptures had been replaced by New Light, Rutherford's books, The Harp of God, 1921, Comfort for the Jews, 1925, and Deliverance, 1926, being the official substitutes. In this way, Rutherford deflected attention away from the failed predictions and interpretations, even his own, the Harp of God had undergone extensive revision by 1928, and switched attention from the message to the method of its delivery. All Bible students were by now expected to go door to door. This was the test by which God now evaluated who was faithful and who was not, who was Christian and who was hypocrite. Of course, historical retrospect allows us to see that in reality, it was Rutherford's test, not God's. By 1931, the Watchtower's second president had determined who really was the faithful and discreet slave, and it wasn't any longer C.T. Russell. When in that year Rutherford renamed the Bible students Jehovah's Witnesses, with a small w by the way, Russell had insisted that denominational names were of the devil, cynics could be heard to remark on the true significance of the J in J.W., all the books, booklets, and phonograph records which witnesses now carried with them house to house were creations of one man, Joseph F. Rutherford. The faithful ones were definitely no longer Russellites, as the public had always called them, but were now Joe's witnesses. In the next segment, we'll talk about the problem the witnesses now faced, an identity crisis, and also how the witnesses over the decades have justified door-to-door -door evangelism.